Yes, please. Good morning, everyone. You are welcome to today's class. Good morning. Thank you. Motunde, I believe you can also hear me. Okay, so if you know you cannot unmute uh, your mic uh, because of where you are, you can always drop your message in the chat box. Okay. Thank you. So today we'll be taking the topic, the administration of companies' income tax. The administration of companies' income tax. So last week we discussed the implication of accounting standard. Okay, so we, we look at the impact of accounting standards on taxable profits. And also we look at the difference between different tasks as well as uh, income tax and levy under IFRS. So we look at uh, IES 12 and then IFR, IFRC uh, 21. Okay, so uh, we discuss mostly, or let me say in brief, we discuss almost all the accounting standards. Okay, so issued by the IASB and IFAC. Okay, so we discuss the international accounting standard from one to 41, from one to 41. And then also we discuss the international financial reporting standard uh, from one to uh, 16. Okay, so we didn't discuss the uh, reissued standard of IFRS 17 <clears throat> because uh, at the time, or let me say that is yet to be included in your syllabus, okay? So it is yet to be included in your syllabus. Though we have IFRS 4, which is uh, insurance. So IFRS 17 is the IFRS 4 reissued standard. So that is the IFRS 4 we no longer, or well, is no longer in effect, but we have IFRS 17, which replaces IFRS 4. So for each of these accounting standards, you know, we started with the IFRS 1 because what we are considering is it has to do with uh, when the International Financial Report Standard was adopted in Nigeria. Okay, so as far back as 2011, okay. <clears throat> so as far back as 2011, 2010. So it means that almost all companies will be affected by the provision of IFRS 1, which has to do with the first time adoption of IFRS, first time adoption of IFRS. So it means all assets and liabilities now has to be recognized in line with the provision of IFRS or IAS. And also, you should not recognize any, as, any items of assets and liabilities that are not within the scope of the IFRS or IAS, as the case may be. Okay, so then you have to reclassify items that is recognized in accordance with the previous Nigerian general accounting and generally accepted accounting procedure <clears throat> and sorry principle rather so NGAP is Nigerian general accepted accounting principle okay so all items that are previously recognized under GAP as one type of asset liability or component of equity but a different type of asset liability a component of equity in accordance with IFRS. So those assets needs to be classified in line with the IFRS provision. Then also you have to you know, apply IFRS in measuring all recognized assets and liabilities. 
So basically, what IFRS is all about, IFRS do you know, speak about the definition of its standard, its, of the standard itself. And then it tells you about the recognition criteria, the recognition criteria. Then also it's, you no, know, it will tell you about the measurement criteria, measurement criteria, then presentation criteria, presentation, and finally, disclosure. So for all elements of, for all elements of the financial statement, be it assets, liabilities, income, expenses and equity has to you know pass through all these five you know elements of a standard okay all these five elements of a standard so an asset so you know you, you should understand the definition of an asset okay that that is you have the control of the assets you can direct the use of that asset so the ownership the risk and liability or the reward, the risk and reward, you know, is within your control and is no is upon you. So then how do you recognize it? Okay, so where should you recognize that then you need to look at okay, what type of asset is this? Is it an item of property plant and equipment? Is it inventory? So if it's an item of property plant and equipment, you recognize under what's under your non-current asset. And if it is an inventory, you recognize under current assets as inventory. So you look at the measurements. How do you measure your inventory? For instance, the standard says that inventories are to be measured at lower of what's lower of cost and net realizable value. At their lower of cost and net realizable value. Then you look, want to look at the presentation. No, sorry. Uh, the recognition has to do with, okay, when should we recognize this asset? Okay, so then you need to look at the control. You need you need to look at the uh, cost. You know the, the definition of the cost and the likes. Then also you need to look at okay. So will you be holding these assets for sale? Will you be holding these assets for use as an inventory in the course of production? Are you holding it for rental purpose and the like? So that has to do with the recognition. But the presentation has to do with where should you, you know, present it in the financial statement? Are you presenting it under income statement of certain financial position or cash flow? We are presenting it under the statement of financial position, under what section of the certain financial position? So is it going under non-current liability or current asset or non-current assets and likes? Then the disclosure. So the standard also allows for disclosure, which for instance, for inventory, if there was, if there are write down of inventory, because, their uh, cost is higher than their net realizable value, or probably their, their damage uh, inventory, or obsolete inventories and the like. So all of these have what has their tax implication. They all have their tax implications. And that was what we discussed uh, last week. So this is just to you know, uh, take a, uh, what was it called? a brief revision of what we did in our last class. So my question to you now is, what are your take home? Okay, what do you learn? What, do you, what, what did you learn from this class last week, uh, Sunday? So good, I know you are in class with me. Motunde Abbas was also in class then with Barak. Biliki Zunide, it seems this is your first time you are joining us. You are highly welcome. Kindly on Miss, uh, kindly join with your audio, so that you can also have the privilege to you know speak in a class. Okay, so if you have any issue on how to join, you can, uh, okay, log out then join back. So you, you receive a prompt message. Do you want to join over Wi-Fi or cellular stuff? So just click on it. So then your mic will come up. Hello. So I hope you got that. Okay, so good. What are your key takeaways from this class last week? 
Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to disappoint you. But uh, trust me, I am reading and trying to understand this IFRS because the, the, uh, it seems to be a little uh, modern, I know. So I'm still trying to understand it. Okay. Then move to the Abbas. <clears throat> what are your takeaways from this class last week? No response from Mutunde. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think I'm just trying to take a grasp of you know what can be done about. Okay. Uh, so I might not be able to give any, any you know, kind of <laughs> response. So sorry. Sorry, it's like I can barely hear you. I said I'm just trying to take a you know a draft of what you know transition is all about. I've been struggling with it for some time, so I just feel you know it might not be anything good for me to say anything for now. Okay. I'm not well grounded. No problem. Okay, so Mubarak. Mubarak, do you have anything for us? Okay, no problem. So I advise you guys to, you know, immediately after the class, go through your class notes. Then also, um, when the video is uh, has been uploaded to the YouTube, uh, uh, link or channel. Okay, so always try to listen to those lectures again. Jot down some key points. Okay, so pick up your study test or your pathfinder questions. Okay, your past questions. Okay, so browse through the past questions, search for where the topic has been tested before. So look at how the examiner sets the questions, then try to practice them, try to practice them. So if you are consistent with this, I'm very sure uh, you'll pass this exam at once, at one sitting. Okay, so today we'll be looking at the administration okay, of computing. Okay, so because this is income tax class, so we only be focusing on income tax. So, and under income tax, we have the company's income tax, and we have what? We have the personal income tax. Company's income tax are what? And personal income tax. So, that's what we'll be discussing all through to the end of this diet. Okay. So then, okay, we discuss capital gains tax too, because capital gains tax is uh, is a tax on profit. Okay, so under this topic, the following shall be discussed: one, the constitutionality of income tax and administration of powers of federal inland revenue services. Registration of companies for tax assessment and payment, types of assessments, these government assessments, turnover basis of assessments, self assessments, best of judgments, additional assessments, dividend basis, and the likes. Okay, so, and then we look at the objection and appeals process. So, was in your class or um, the foundation class. So I've, I mentioned that when a taxpayer is aggrieved of, so take for instance now, you know, the tax system in Nigeria is that all taxpayers are to assess themselves. So we call it, we call that self-assessment. We call it self-assessment. That is, 
you yourself you determine what you should pay as tax, making reference to the various provisions of the tax law or the applicable provision of the tax law. Okay, so then the FRS will have to you know review whatever you have uh, claimed to be payable as tax. Then they compare it with their competition. Then if your if their competition is higher than yours, and they are very sure that they take in, they, they take cognizance of the you know provisions of the task law, so they will invite you where they are having what where they are having disagreement in your computation. So that if they are doing it from their office, we call it desk desk review. We call it what we call it desk review. The task provision also the task law also you know allows the allow the uh, task authority to also carry out periodic task audits. What do I call it? Periodic task audit. So usually they may you know wish to audit your company for one year, three years, three years, four years, five years. So most time it usually covers a period of five years, especially when especially if that is the first time they are coming for the audit of your company. Okay, if that's the first time they are coming from your, for, for the audit of your company. So this is different from the statutory audit. This is different from the statutory audit required under the provision of the companies and allied matters as 2020. Okay, so now when they come around, the request for your books and every other documents has been required. Okay, so if they're doing that, we call that what it is a periodic task audit, but we call it what we call it feed audit. We call it what feed audit because they are carrying out the audit on the premises of the task payer. They are carrying out the audit on the premises of the task payer, unlike the one they are doing in their office. Are we together? So then, upon the conclusion of this field audit, they come up with a report. Okay, so if the report says you should pay additional task liability, they come up with additional task liability, they may raise the assessment, have some reconciliation meeting with you. Okay, so. If you agree with them, okay, so it means they will go and raise the notice of assessment, okay, so which they will indicate when and what you should pay as tasks, including penalty and interest, okay, but when you disagree with them, okay, you know, they raise the notice of assessment, then you are allowed to object. So by your, your, your by right, okay, you can object. Their, their assessments, okay? You can object their assessments. So when you receive a notice of assessment, you respond to them, setting your basis of objection. And if they disagree, they may know, they may send what a final assessment. So after receiving a notice of assessment and you have responded, setting your ground of objection, they you know, can send you final assessments if they're also of the opinion that no, you are not taking your view, okay? So, and then when they send you a final assessment, then you can you can send them a notice of objection of the assessments. You send them a notice of objection of the assessments, okay? So in that case also, you would, you have to you know run to the task appeal tribunal. You need to run to the task appeal tribunal that oh. Baba, I have come to you. So I am in disagreement with this task authority. And these are my grounds of objection. Okay, so these are the things we are going to look at as we progress in this class. I hope you will enjoy it. Okay, so we also look at the statute of limitation and powers of task authorities to audit open years. Okay, so that is. You know, by law, they cannot audit more than, you know, I think it's five years, okay, five or six years, thereabouts. Okay, so it means that 
if your company has been in existence in operation for like eight years and you have not received any of the tax auditors since you commenced, it therefore means that whenever they you know, intend to audit your company, they can only audit uh, you know, a period of five to six years, starting from the immediate year, uh, immediate previous year. Okay, so starting starting from what, starting from the immediate previous year. So meaning that we are now in 2023. Okay, so they can only say that they want to audit. So you know, in this 2023 of assessment, you'll be submitting 2022 accounts. You'll be submitting tax computation for 2022 accounts. So if they are bringing you notice for their audit this year, it therefore means that they are starting from 2021. Okay, so they will end in 2021. So if you count six, six or five years back, so this should be around 2015. Do you understand? So it will either be 2015 to 2020 or 2015 to 2021. So that 2022 cannot be, or cannot be part of this. So they cannot go beyond this period a period of either five or six years back, meaning that the remaining two years is what is out of the scope. The remaining two years is out of the scope. So they may, you know, they may now, you know, get an order, okay, that lifts this limitation to exceed these five or six years. And this usually happens when there's investigation, okay? So Maybe during the audit of these five or six years, they, there are some information, you know, that they came across and they felt, oh, we need to, you know, audit these other two years as well. So those years will be referred to as the open years. Then we look at the component of tax returns, capital allowances, financial statements, assessment forms, the due date for filing, then the payment due dates. Okay, then how to resolve conflict between the self-assessment regulations and the company's income tax act, the tax client certificate. I want to believe we've all heard about tax client certificate before. Am I correct? Yes. That's fine. Okay, so we're also going to look at that in this class. So that's all we'll be doing for today. So at the end of this class, you should understand the administration of companies in contacts in Nigeria the procedure for objection and appeal, as well as the procedure for obtaining your tax clearance certificate. So uh, <clears throat> we also, if time permits us, we should decide and uh, we should discuss a, a decided case. Okay. We should discuss a decided case between some companies and the FIRS. <clears throat> Between some some companies and the, and the FIRS as regards our uh, tax clearance certificates. So, what do you understand by the word uh, administration of companies income tax? What do you understand by the term or by the words administration of companies income tax? Good. Yes, my definition of uh, administration of company income tax could be to my own understanding uh, the procedure or the day-to-day uh, -day activities that aids um, the deductions or um, how would I call it deductions or um, assessment of um, a company's income tax. Okay, Billy Keith, you want to try? Billy Keith, can you please unmute your mic and speak? Hello, Billy Keys. Can you hear me? Ambrosia, what do you understand by the words administration of companies income tax? Um, it is the process of implementing tax law. That is the process of uh, making taxpayers to pay the right amount of tax. 
Okay. Mubarak, do you want to try? Hello, Mubarak. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the administration, that is the processes that is involved in uh, how companies are expected to make their, uh, to pay their taxes, as in the processes involved and their different, uh, the regulations or percentages that is involved for companies so that they'll be able to know their tax liabilities when they are going to pay their taxes, how they are going to pay it and what they are expected to pay. That's my own contribution. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the administration of companies income tax. So in your exam, if you are asked, you need to start with who has that power to administer the tax. You know, yeah, we are speaking about companies income tax. Okay, so we are not talking about uh, personal income tax. So you need to be specific and you know be straightforward. So the administration of companies income tax. Companies income tax is vested, you know, on the Federal Inland Revenue Services. Then you can tell us under what list, okay, under what list is companies income tax? Is it under the exclusive list or the concurrent list? So if it is under the exclusive list, so it means that it is a tax that is collected by the federal government, okay? And the federal government now vested the power on who? On the Federal Inland Revenue Service, who is seen as what? As the agency of what? As the agency of the federal government. That's fine. Then the next question is, how is company income tax in Nigeria? Okay, so how is company income tax in Nigeria? So we are going by the provision of the Finance Act of 2019. Then, prior to the provision of the, uh, prior to the signing of the Finance Act of 2019, the tax rate in Nigeria has always been at a flat rate of 30%, except for small companies who are defined to be companies that earn revenue below, you know, below 1 million naira. Companies that earn revenue below 1 million naira. That's the first condition. And again, this company is within their first four years of assessment. They're within their first four years uh, of, you know, of assessment. So please take notes. So, but in line with the Finance Act of 2019, all companies are to be tasked according to the provision of the Finance Act. Though the Finance Act is not as if uh, it is a standalone uh, you know, task law, but instead it is uh, an instrument it is what it is an instrument. Okay, it is an instrument used, you know, to amend, introduce, you know, it's, it's used to amend, introduce, then let me say, and delete. Okay, so it is used to amend the, some of the existing provisions of the, you know, income tax. Act, then also it introduces some new subsection or section to the you know existing companies income tax act, and as well it also deletes some section which seems to no longer be relevant due to the circumstances or the environments we are in today's world, okay and the like. So the Finance Act of 2019 amends the provision of the companies income tax act as far as the rate is concerned. Okay, so then uh, uh, categorize companies into three. Then we have what? Companies who are tasked at 0%, those that will be tasked at 20%, and those that will be tasked at 30%. So what are these companies? Small companies are those that will be tasked at 0%. The medium-sized companies are those that will be tasked at 20%, and then 30% is for the large companies. Then how does the finance art define this? So, Companies that are small companies are those 
companies with gross turnover of 25 million naira and below. Gross turnover of 25 million naira and below. Then the medium sized company are those companies that has revenue turnover, okay, turnover of between 25 million naira and 100 million naira, between 25 million naira and 100 million naira. Then the large companies are those companies that, you know, has a revenue trash, a revenue of above 100 million naira. You say greater than what? Greater than 100 million naira. Okay, so these companies are assessed on preceding year basis, unlike what you experience in your pay as you earn. So if you are working as an employee in an employee employer relationship, you'll be paid salary or wages. Okay, so this remuneration you are receiving. Okay, is subject to tax on a monthly basis. So your uh, your employer has the duty to deduct at the point of paying the salary. Okay, so but for income tax, uh, company's income tax. Okay, so it is paid on preceding year basis, and the same thing goes for individuals who are sole proprietor. Okay, or who are in partnership. Okay, so. Self employed person also pay tax on preceding year basis. However, the provision of the personal income tax act is quite different from that of the company's income tax act. So, the personal income tax act allows for filing within 1st January to 31st of March of the immediate following year, while that of the uh, company's income tax act states that taxpayers are to file their returns within six months. Immediately following the was immediately following the uh, preceding year. Okay, so that is we are in 2023 now. Those companies that have 31st December year end, okay, so their 2022 account is due for filing within 1st January to June 30th. So by June 30th, any company that has a year end of 31st December or November, October, September. Okay, let me just use December because if you can't see one from December, so it ends in June. But if you're using November, then that means that they have fallen due already because it's ended as at 30th, uh, 31st of May. Okay, but for those that have 31st December as their year end, they still have the privilege to file their returns up to 30th, June, up to 30th June. Any company that is default, okay, or what, or filing as at when due, we would, we have to face the consequence. So then we look at the penalties as we progress in this class. So in 1992, okay, or let me say in Nigeria, okay, in Nigeria, the following five tax authorities are responsible for the administration of tax. In Nigeria, the following five tax authorities are responsible for the administration of tax. So we have the Joint Tax Board, so which is like a middleman between the Federal Internal Revenue Service and the State Board of Internal Revenue Service. So these guys settle disputes that may arise or that arose between the Federal Internal Revenue Service Board and the State Board of Internal Revenue Service. Okay, so. However, or let me say, as we progress in the class, so we look at the composition, okay? The composition of each of these uh, task authorities. And then also we have the local government revenue committee at the local government level. And then also we have the joint state revenue committee. So this joint state revenue committee, you know, is the middleman between the state board of internal revenue service and the local government revenue committee. And the chairman is always the chairman of the state internal revenue service. Also, the chairman for this joint task board is always the chairman of the federal land revenue service. Are we together? Okay. Yes. So, so this technical committee, okay, they set up. That should be an addition to this, okay? So we also have technical committee. But I, I, be, I want to believe it's also part of the notes uh, we'll be seeing in subsequent slides. Okay, so, <clears throat> so 
sorry. So this, the, these five task authorities, you know, like I said earlier, they are responsible, they are responsible for the administration of us, of tasks in Nigeria. So anything that involves uh, assessment, collection of tasks, so we start from, now let me put it this way, start from registration, okay? Registration, assessment, collection, okay? Assessment and collection of us, collection of taxes, assessment and collection of taxes from both companies and individuals, from both companies and individuals by the relevant tax authorities in a way that an appropriate tax amount is, you know, is efficiently and correctly corrected. So this will reduce the incidence of tax evasion and then tax uh, avoidance. So having you know said having said this, then we need to look at what gave them the power. You know, our focus here is on the Federal Land Revenue Service. So what is the constitutional power that they have to go after people? They have the right to seal your company, your premises, especially when you are in default. They have the right to seal. They have the right to access your books. They have the right to access everything, your banking details and the likes. Okay, they have access to everything. So they have that constitutional power. Are we together? Okay, so, <clears throat> so if you want to understand this better, so you can, you can go to our YouTube uh, link. Okay, so check the chapter two for principles of taxation. I, I want to believe I discussed this extensively there, okay? So where I discussed the sources of Nigerian tax law, okay? So that's that. So the constitutional power to impose tax lies with who? Lies with the National Assembly. Lies with the National Assembly. Where is National Assembly? Okay, so which of the arms of government does National Assembly falls within? Hello. Legislative organ. Okay, thank you. So they are part of the what? They are let me they are even the legislative organ. It's not that they are part, they are the legislature. Okay, so they make the law. They do what? They make the law for the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Okay, so sorry. So also at the state level, okay? So at the state level, what do we have? What represents the National Assembly at the state level? The State House of Assembly. State House of Assembly. So this State House of Assembly also can impose specific taxes in their jurisdiction. And a good example is that is what we see in Lagos states, which is consumption tax. Consumption, what's consumption tax? Apart from that, we also have what we also have what we call land use charge. We also have what we call land use charge. A, a lot. We also have one something like structural levy and the likes. Okay. So because these house of assemblies also also have their their own jurisdictional. Don't let me use. Yes, I can use the jurisdictional power. Okay, that is power within their within their own territory. Are we together? So. This is under the what taxes and levies approved list for collection acts. Okay, so so let's look at the composition. So the composition of what composition of the the composition of the federal inland revenue service. So yeah, if you're looking at the composition, the rights, the powers, and what and the functions of the uh, you know, various task organs, of the various task organs. So 
There are various types of task organs concerned with the administration of tasks. Okay, and these organs are confined, you know, they are, they are, their own concern is just to administer tasks. Their concern is, you know, on the administration of tasks. So they have the powers and functions. Okay, they have the powers and functions, and their compositions vary in accordance with their existence. They are, you know, their composition, you know, varies in accordance with their, with their existence. So good for the YouTube link, kindly uh, chat with the admin, okay? So you can chat with the meetup way. <clears throat> so now let's discuss their composition, the rights, powers, and their functions. So the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board is established under section three of the Federal Inland Revenue Service uh, Establishment Act, F-I-R-S-E-A. So anywhere you see F-I-R-S-E-A, you know it means Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act. That is in your taxation, no. I'm not talking of any other thing. You know, anybody can uh, form, the, form, form the name. So someone can say, this is Femi, Irene, Rhoda, Sarah, Elizabeth, and Aaron. So anybody can give it any name. Okay, so, but when you see it in your task, when you see it in task, just know that it refers to the Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act of 2007 as amended because the Finance Act has, you know, amended some of the provision of this act. So this section three, you know, makes provision for the establishment of the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board and this board consists of the following. This board consists of what consists of the following. These include the executive chairman of the service. So today, who is the executive chairman of FIRS? Hello. Hello. Are you guys there? Ambrosia. Hi. Executive Shaman for FIRS. Good. Sorry, I don't know this current person's name. Okay. Farouk. What's the what's the name of this of the present shaman of FIRS? Hmm? Is it Muhammad Nami? Okay, yes. Okay. Correct. So that's the name of the current uh, 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 chairman of the FIRS. So the executive chairman of the FIRS is also what is also the chairman, you know, of the what of the uh, uh, Federal Inland Revenue Service Board. It's also the chairman of the board. So it, it usually it, whoever whoever that is appointed as the executive chairman of the FRS, you know, it has always been someone with experience in taxation. So most time, over 15 or 20 years of experience in taxation. And they are usually appointed by, by the president, subject to the confirmation of what, subject to the confirmation of the what, of the Senate. Okay, so if the senators, do not like the person. They may drag you, drag you, drag you, drag you, drag you. They will not approve. Okay, so the person may just be in acting, acting, whatever. Okay, so they will not approve. And well, if they don't approve, the president cannot just. So it is subject. So the president has the right to appoint someone with a, with a well experience. So after the appointment, it is subject to confirmation of the Senate. So what are the Senate doing? How do they confirm? They invite the person. You know, they interview the person. So then they reach their conclusion based on what? Based on any other exercise they must have carried out on the person. Then also we have six members with relevant qualifications. These six members, they are not just picked from anywhere. They are picked from each of the six geopolitical zones we have in Nigeria. And these people, they must have relevant qualifications and expertise, okay? 
So they are also, you know, appointed by the president as well. So how many people do we have appointed by the president now? We have us. We have two categories of people. One is the executive chairman, then two six members with relevant qualifications and expertise from each of the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. So these two guys, okay, or two set of people are um, uh, appointed by the president. Then also we should have a representative of the Anthony General of the Federation on the board of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. We are not stopping there. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria or his representative should also be on the board. Should also, should also be on the board of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Okay. Then a representative, a representative of the Minister of Finance. So this time we are not bringing in the Minister of Finance. Rather, we are bringing in what is representative or whosoever, in fact, is representative. But this person must not be low, you know, must not be below the rank of a director, must not be below the rank of a director. Then also the chairman of the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Physical Commission or his representative, who shall be any of the commissioners representing the 36 states of the Federation. So the chairman of the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Physical Commission may choose to appoint himself as a, you know, a member of the FRS board or delegate this to any of his, any of his commissioners to represent him on the board. So meaning that the commissioner will be reporting to the chairman of the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Physical Commission. And then also among the you know, board member of FRS is the group managing director the group managing director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, group managing director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, or his representative, who shall not be below the rank of a group executive director, who shall not be below what? Below the rank of a group executive director or the corporation or itself, or the corporation or itself, uh, sorry or it's equivalent rather, okay? So also we have the Comptroller General of the Nigerian Custom or his representative, which shall not be below the rank of, uh, you know, Deputy Comptroller General, the Registrar General of the Corporate Affairs Commission or his representative not below the rank of the director. And lastly, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Planning Commission or his representative not below the rank of a director. My question. How many people do we have on the board of the FIRS? How many people do we have on the board of the Federal Inland Revenue Service? Mubarak, are you still in class? Okay, Mubarak is not in class. Billy Keys. How many people do we have on the board of the Federal Inland Revenue Service? Not counted, but they look, they seem to be about 12 to 14 persons. We have named them. We have the chairman of the FIRS. One. We have the uh, uh, we have the controller general, we have the registrar general of the corporate affairs uh, commission, we have the chief executive officer of the national planning commission. That's four. That's four. Over 12. The past, the past mark is 50. And four over 12 is just like 33%. Okay, I'm okay, Ambrosia, you want to try? I know they are about 15. They are about 16. Okay, you are named them. Um, I know six persons from the geopolitical zones. That's yeah, six. In addition to the one she has named now. No, they are the same. <laughs> I named that one. There's a, there's a central bank. Uh, 
the governor of the central bank or his representative? Oh yeah, Ambrosia continue. It now have the same age, so you to yeah, you mentioned C's at, 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 at one point. So C's uh, people appointed by the president who must have relevant experience to receive the Yes. So yeah, the, yeah. the chairman of the FRS. That's it. Mm -hmm. The um, NMPC. I know somebody from the NMPC. The managing director of the NMPC. NMPC, yes. Uh, his representative, who must not be the rank of group okay. executive director. Okay. Yes. Then representative of the Central Bank of Nigeria, not below the rank of the director. Okay, that's nine. Okay. Um, is Chief Executive Officer of National Planning Commission, okay. or is representative? That's ten. The Registrar of the Corporate Affairs Commission, or its representative? Okay, yeah, just you are Maybe. good. You 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 carry the spot on these <laughs> that are showing. Oh, voila. But you didn't even remember to mention their representative. What if they are they are taking are asking someone to represent them on the court? Okay. So anyway, to save our time, so it's just to test your, your understanding. Please, I ensure you familiarize yourself with the with those people that are you know a member of the board of FIRS as well as their chairman. So then let's talk about the secretary. Who should be the secretary? Okay, so the secretary should be, uh, you know, from the FRS. So when we get there, we discuss that. Okay, when we get there, we discuss that. So please, those that are that should be appointed by the president, please take note of them. Okay, so other than the executive chairman, okay, other than the executive chairman, all other members, okay. All other members of the what of the board shall be what shall be on part time basis. Shall be what shall be on part time basis. Are we together? Because from what you can see here, other than the chairman of the FRS, do we see any other people here that are part of the FRS or that is part of the FRS? Is there another person that is part of the FRS here, apart from the executive chairman? Answer my question now. No. So every other member of the board shall be part-time members. So I said that the executive chairman is appointed by the president, but subject to the confirmation of what? Subject to the confirmation of uh, uh of the, the Senate. Senate. Are we? Okay, yes. so and I mentioned that this person must be well experienced in taxation. You see, it does not end there. He must have cognitive experience and skills in what in accountancy. Because accounting is the root of taxation. Okay, so it must have a, he or she must have cognitive experience in accountancy, economics. Okay. Economics because transition is one of the physical uh, policy too. Okay, it's one of the physical policy too. So, and if the shaman is, does not have any basic understanding of what economics is, so then what's the why should they be appointed as the shaman? Then you should have an understanding of you know of law. So you should have experience about the law. So it's not necessary he knows everything because he may not be a lawyer, he may be an accountant, he may be an economist. Okay, so, but these are just the basic thing and any other related fit. Okay, <clears throat> so this person must also be a qualified, if, it's a, if the person is an accountant, it must be a qualified accountant. Okay, so I mean professional accountant. And if the person is a task uh, practitioner, so this person must be a member of 
any uh, the relevant professional body. So because he's the chief executive and accounting officer of the FRS and also responsible for the execution of both, for the execution of policy and the day date was day to day administration, day to day administration of the affairs of the FIRS, day to day administration of the affairs of the FIRS. So uh, before we take the tenure, okay, so let me briefly mention that the secretary of the board or the secretary to the board, okay, the secretary to the board will also be coming from the FIRS, okay, because if you go and pick any of these person that are on part time basis, the, the they may they may not be uh consistency in their approach to work with the executive chairman, okay, because the secretary must always be available. So the secretary to the board will be appointed by the board, okay. The board will appoint the person, but will be from within. It will be what. It will be from within the FIRS. It will be from within the FIRS. So the function of the secretary uh, include issuing notices of meeting, issuing what, issuing notices of meeting, then also what, uh, also keep records. So keeping what, keeping of records keeping of records of proceedings of the board and carrying out such other duties as the executive chairman, as well as the executive chairman may from time to time direct the secretary. Okay, so I've known who the, uh, the composition of the board, then let's look at their tenure. How long do they stay in office? Okay, so, they had to stay in office for a period of four years. So that's a term, okay? So a term for this board is a period of four years. And this is renewable once, only on such terms and conditions that may be specified in uh, the appointment letter, okay? So again, a member of the FRS board, excluding the S official members, who are S official members? If you are reading something and you see S official members, who are they? Former members. So maybe those that have retired or those that their tenure has expired as a member of the board. Do you understand? As a member of the board. So, so a member of the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board Excluding the S official members, we hold office for a term of four years and renewable ones, only on such terms and conditions as may be specified in his or a letter of appointment. As may be specified in his or appointment and letter house together. Okay, so let's move to cessation of membership of the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board. Cessation of membership of the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board. So they may ask you in another way, okay? They may ask you in another way. For instance, they may ask you that, when will, you know, uh, a member of the board of FIRS is said to be disqualified Okay, or what disqualify a member of the board to continue to be a member of the board. Okay, so apart from this first one, okay, apart from this first one, every other point here, you know, is what, uh, uh, every other point here is a relevant point to your question if asked in an indirect way, that what disqualifies a member of the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board to continue to be a member. One is when he's of a sound mind, okay? Someone that cannot regain his conscience. When he becomes bankrupt or makes a compromise with his creditors. So you can't put someone like that in the board, 
So who is he or she representing? Okay. So because it will affect the the the, the board. It will be it will affect the decision they will be making. So where is that integrity coming from? Okay. So if the person is convicted of felony or of any offense involving dishonesty or corruption, okay. So then there will be loss of confidence. You understand? There will be loss of confidence. Then if the person becomes incapable of carrying on the functions of his office, either arising from an infirmity of mind or body. So for, for this one, there will be lack of competency. Lack of us, lack of competency. Okay, read it again. When he becomes incapable of carrying on the functions of his office, either arising from an infirmity of mind or body. Please take note. So then other ones include what? Where he voluntarily resigns, okay? So then it says of being a member of the words of the FRS board, okay? So where he resigns his appointment as a board by notice under his hands and address to the president, and then the president is satisfied that it is not in the interest of the FRS or in the interest of the public for the person to continue in office and the president removes him from office. So like what's recently happened uh, to some of the agents of the federal government, we have the CBN, okay? So the, uh, the governor was initially suspended, okay? Then something else follows for the EFCC. Okay, the shaman was suspended. Then something else follows. So it is only the president, okay, that can suspend them. So and indirectly, when you are suspended, you are gone. Okay, you are, you are gone. So you are, you, are, you are out of the system. Okay, so because it's not possible they bring you back. So in as much that it is only the president that has the right to remove you and he has suspended you. You know what that means? Okay, then we also, if the person is found guilty of contravening the code of conduct bureau and tribunal act or gross misconduct in relation to his duties. So like what happened to the CBN governor? It seems, you know, he's found guilty of contravening this, you know, the CBN act. So also in the case of a person possessing a professional qualification, is disqualified by a competent authority, or in the case of a person who becomes a member by virtue of the office he occupies, he ceases to hold such office. So an example of this person is the secretary. Abby is the secretary to the board, or let's say any other of the ministry, let's say the, uh, I mentioned now, let's say the registrar, Registrar General of the Corporate Affairs Commission. Okay, so you know these people. It is by virtue of the office they are holding that they become a member of the board. So once their tenure ceases or the uh, expires in that office they are holding, so it automatically they no, they will no, no longer be a member of the board. Do you understand? So for instance, now. Let's take the CBN. So the governor is appointing someone, okay, representing him, and the person must not be below the rank of what the, below the rank of the director, if I'm right. Okay, so it means that this person, if he was appointed, let's say in 2020, and he has just three years to his uh, retirement age. Okay, so it means that by the end of 2023, it should cease to continue to be what it should, it should cease to be a member of the FRS board. Because by 2023, you'll be leaving the office of the central bank. So indirectly, we also have to, have to cease to be a member of the FRSB. I hope you understand that. Please take notes. You can always read them up again. So then we move to the powers and functions of the FRS board. What are their powers? So they have power to provide general policy guidelines, 
to manage and superintend the policies of the service, review and approve the strategic plans of the service, employ and determine the times and conditions of service, including disciplinary measures of the employees of the service. Then they stimulate remuneration, they determine the allowances to be paid, the benefits and pensions of staff and employees in consultation with the National Salaries, Income and Wages Commission. So they determine what they determine the remuneration of the member of the and sort of the staff of the FRS, the allowances, benefits, and pension of staff and employees. This will usually be in consultation with the National Salaries, Income and Wages Commission and do such other things which in their opinion are necessary to ensure the efficient performance of the functions of the service under the Federal Inland Revenue Service Open Bracket Establishment Act of 2007. Am I speaking to your sense? Hello. Please repeat that again. Okay, so the board also have power they also they also have power to do such other things which in their opinion are necessary to ensure the efficient performance of the functions of the service the service here is referring to the firs okay so under the act and which act are we referring to we are referring to the federal inland revenue service establishment act of 2007. So, if you want to write this, you write Federal Inland Revenue Service, okay, then you open bracket establishment, okay, establishment, you close your bracket, act 2007. Let me show you here. Please, it's so can you see it? So, this is what I'm dictating. Don't worry, you two, you will soon know everything without looking, your, looking at your book. Okay, so now let's look at the establishment itself. Let's take the establishment itself. But before we go, let me reemphasize that the FRS is charged with the power of assessment. You know, I said this earlier. Okay, they can assess, they can collect, and accounts, they must account for all the revenue they collect. You know, they have assets and they have, they have collected, they have collected money on behalf of the federal government. So now they have the responsibility to account for their revenue, you know, accruing to the federal government of Nigeria and for any other related matters. Okay. So because the object of the FRS is to control and administer, is to do what is to control and then administer is to control and administer the different taxes and laws specified in the first schedule of the FIRSEA of the FIRSEA or other laws made or to be made. So other laws include the finance acts. Okay, so recently you see them issuing circulars, explanation, uh, information circular public notices, information circular and public notices to, you know, to the public, to the public as regards the implementation and implication of the provisions, you know, of the Finance Act of 2022, of the Finance Act of 2022. Are we together? Hello, are we together? Yes. And don't forget that all laws are made by the National Assembly, by the National Assembly. Okay, so then establishment of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. So in brief, let's look at some of the, you know, uh, provision of the establishment, sorry, the Federal Inland Revenue Service uh, establishment as 2007. So the federal government promulgated an act in what year? In 2007. This act provides for the establishment of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. 
then remember it was section three that confers the power on them. Now, section one of the act makes provision for the establishment of the service and then provides that the service shall be a body corporate with perpetual succession and a common seal. The uh, service shall be a body corporate with perpetual succession and a common seal and may sue or be sued in its corporate name. So that's why you've been saying companies suing FIRS. We have the case of MTN and, multi, uh, MTN and FIRS, though in their case, was it the FIRS that sued them or they are the one that sued the FIRS? I'm not sure. Then we have the case of multi choice versus FIRS. We have the case of Elijah B, whatever, and FIRS, a lot. We have the case of Tetra Park. Okay, we have the case of Tetra Park and FIRS. Just mention, we have the case of Seven Up and FIRS. FRS, almost every company, you know, has taken them to court. So, except for my own company, then we have, they may acquire or dispose of any property, be it a movable property or an immovable property for the purpose of carrying out any of its function under this act. So, they may acquire an asset, that's why you see some of their offices, they have staff, uh, staff boss, okay? especially in those that are regional or uh, state head office. So they have staff boss and the likes. So they may acquire, hold or dispose of any property. They may sell some of the property in as much that it's for the purpose of carrying out any of their function under the act. So according to the act, the service shall have such powers and duties as conferred on needs, you know, by the heart or by any other enactment of the past law. And another a good example I will still be referring to is that of the Finance Act, okay? Is that of the Finance Act. And any other law, okay, you know, on such matters on which the National Assembly, on which the National Assembly has power to make law. Are we together? Okay, so then let's look at their functions. Functions of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Section eight of the FIRCA makes provisions for the functions of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. So I said earlier, they have the power to assess. So they assess persons, including companies. Okay, so try to understand this. These persons, remember, oh, was it in your class? I'm not sure. So persons there are referring to the uh, personnel of the Nigeria Armed Forces. Nigerian Police Commission and uh, all these, uh, what do you call them? Uh, foreign deponents, you know, among others. So also, they have power to assess, collect, account, and enforce payment of taxes as will be due to the government or any of its agencies. They have power to collect, recover, and pay to the designated accounts. Also, in collaboration with the relevant ministries and agencies, they have power to review the tax regimes and promote the application of tax revenues to stimulate economic activities and development. So the finance act, as mentioned since, is not as if it's just the National Assembly that's drafted the finance act. No, some people drafted it. Okay, so we have, amongst them, we have the tax experts and the likes. Okay, so we have also, you know, the FRS people. Okay, so they have their, uh, they have also a department that does this or a committee, okay, that does that so in, in conjunction with the task expert. So there's physical policy committee, okay, so there's physical policy committee. So and there are different individuals that you know, comprise of this committee. So that form the committee. So also in collaboration with relevant law enforcement agencies, they carry out the examination and investigation with a view to enforcing compliance with the provisions of the FICA. So you might have seen them before. So they also go around with police, especially if they are doing investigation. Okay. So if they are doing investigation or they want to come and seal up your premises or whatsoever, what have you. So the reason why they have to go out with the enforcement agencies 
Here is this Nigeria. Okay, so if they don't do that, you can imagine what we used to do to the when when it, it is it was still Nepal. Okay, what we used to do to them. So some will be, uh, you know, thrown away from the from the ladder. They fight, they fight. Nigerians fight some of the officers of these Nepal and the likes. Even when it's when it's metamorphosed to PhDN, people still fight them too. Nigeria, we always fight. Sha, huh? Anyway. So they have to go you know, around with law enforcement agencies. So it's just to reduce any, any uh, force on them. Then also from time to time they make or uh, they make a determination of the extent of financial loss. Then also adopt measures to identify, trace, they may freeze or confiscate your accounts. Okay, so they freeze accounts, especially if you are under investigation or you have not been paying your taxes and they've sent you letters, blah, blah, blah. So they can freeze your accounts. So they have access to that. You can see the provision of the Federal Revenue Service Establishment Act, you know, gives, that, gives them that power. So also they can adopt measures which include compliance and regulatory actions, introduction and maintenance of investigative and control techniques, then also collaborate and facilitate rapid exchange of information. So uh, during the COVID year, though they have been pushing for that, so there is this thing in international taxation that we call, uh, remind me of uh, the exchange of information. Okay, okay, we call it country country by country, country by country reporting, country by country reporting, CBCR. So basically this CBCR, CBCR, okay, is for, is for exchange of information, especially for the multinational companies. So the tax authority in Nigeria exchange information about the Nigerian entity with, another tax authority in another jurisdiction in another country. For instance, maybe the parent company, let's say South Africa. So they exchange information with the tax authority in South Africa and the South Africa also exchange information of the South Africa entity with the Nigerian tax authority. Okay, so we call it country by country reporting. So this is just to take a measure on what, on tax evasion because of some companies that are investing in the tax haven countries okay, so that no no country will be shifted you know or will be denied of its rights to to assess tax to fully assess tax on the you know on the company operating within its jurisdiction so this is a type error 1111 okay so then again uh, establish and maintain a system for monitoring international dynamics of taxation, provide and maintain access to up-to-date and adequate data and information, maintain database statistics, records and reports on persons, organizations, proceeds, properties, documents, or, or other items. And that's why we have TIN number. So that TIN number is like an account, your bank account with the FIRS. Okay, so anything you want to do with FIRS, you must provide you know, you must submit that account number. Okay, that's your same number. You must submit it. So that's, you know, what they use to keep your record. So also undertake and support research on similar measures, collate and continually review all policies of the federal government relating to transition and revenue generation. And also liaise. Okay, the liaise with the Office of the Attorney General of Federation, especially when there is litigation issue, when there is when there is litigation uh, issue. Then also the issue taxpayer identification number, they carry out and sustain rigorous, rigorous public awareness and alignment campaign. And a good example is the various circulars I mentioned. We also have public notice. 
okay, public notice. So imagine what happened in 2020, 2020, despite we are in the COVID year, uh, when they come up with a public notice or information circular on stamp duty, on stamp duty, they heard about that in 2020. Hello? No, I didn't. Yes, yes. Uh, when people, it's, 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 the, it's the news that is everywhere. It goes everywhere, it goes around. Mm. So it goes all around. If the media, the media, the everybody. So none of you in this class that was informed about that in 2020. I was aware any amount you deposit in the bank, they will charge them VC if somebody paid money yeah. to your account. So. Okay, 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 okay. Yes, 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 yes. I remember. Yeah. So the people are arguing that uh, why should I be paying stamp duty on my rent? Exactly, exactly. On your transfers too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people do not even know about stamp duty, not until then. Exactly. Has been in existence as far as maybe eighties. Okay. So as far as eighties. So, but people, most people are not aware. <clears throat> okay, because they are not informed. So. If not for the public notice issued by the issued by the FRS, and also if not for the fact that you are opportune to be a student of taxation, you may also not be aware. Okay, so in practice, you know, you see that's be asking what stamp duty. They, they are not aware of the fact that they should be paying stamp duty. Okay, but with this public notice. Information circular issued in 2020, 2020, you know, everywhere, almost everybody are, are now informed of stamp duty. So they also clear the air that the stamp duties should only be paid when you are renting the apartment for the first time. You know, you know, the first time your landlord will issue you rent agreements. Okay, then after that, subsequently it's only the rent receipts you will be getting from the landlord, except where there is modification to the rent agreement. Do you understand? So and when there is modification, you have to pay stamp duty again. So then they have power to carry out oversight functions over all taxes and levies available to the government, then carry out such other activities as are necessary or expedient for the full discharge of all or any of the functions under the FIRCA. So then also, uh, in addition, the service may from time to time specify the form of returns, claims, statements, and notices necessary for the due administration of powers conferred on it by the Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act. If you agree with me, recently or sometimes in April, the April or March, thereabouts this year, the FRS came up with the modalities, you know, uh, of filing the, uh, of filing VAT returns, the new process, the new way of filing VAT returns. And some practitioners are in disagreements with some of you know, those processes. And was it not yesterday or this week, they came up with another uh, public notice, okay, that they have extended the commencement date of that uh, application of the new process. Okay, it will start effective after June 30th or thereabouts, then also uh, the, because then what they are saying is, okay, if you have your input VAT, if you have input VAT, okay, so you have to upload the team number of your customer or your supplier. You have to upload the input VAT of your supplier to claim your uh, input VAT. And if you also have output VAT, you must upload all the TIN numbers of your customers. So if you have 1 million customers, you have to upload the TIN number of all the customers. Okay, so if you are working as a task uh, officer in your company, you should be aware of this. Or if you are working as an accountant in your company, you should be aware. So have, are you aware of uh, what I just mentioned? Are you informed? 
No. Yes. Ah. Okay, is that good? No, it's not okay. Okay, is Ambrosia? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Billy Keys, are you also aware? Mubarak? No, he's not aware. Okay. Okay, so you guys need to be up to date though. Hmm? So because the examiner may choose to go out of the box, okay, that is may decide not to test you, uh, you know, on what you have your study test. So because it is also expected of you as a professional to be up to date. And that's one of the, uh, you know, code of conduct of your uh, professionalism. And that is competency and QK. Are we together? Okay, so um, that's that. So then we have the technical committee. You know, I was about, you know, saying something about the technical committee at the beginning of the class, guys. You know, I skipped it. So section nine of the FRSEA establishes a technical committee of the Federal Inland Revenue Service Board establishes a committee, a technical committee of what, of the Federal Revenue Service Board, board. then what do they do? What's their composition? So the composition of the technical committee of the FRS board consists of the following members. One, the executive chairman of the service, who is also the chairman of the board, we also be the chairman of the technical committee, okay, or shall also be the chairman of the technical committee, and then also all the directors and heads of department of the service. Please don't mix it together. You can see this one is different from the composition of the board of the FIRSO. This one is about the technical committee of the FIRS board. So the FIRS board, we also have technical committee. Okay. So, and their chairman is the chairman of the board. Okay. Then all the directors, all the directors and the heads of departments of the service. We have director of international task policy. We have director of physical policy. We have director of and uh, this, director of that. Do you understand? So these directors and heads of departments of the service are also part of the technical committee and the legal advisor of the service, as well as the secretary to the board, of the FIRS. So these are the composition of the technical committee. Are we together? So they are in four parts. Please take note. Then uh, this technical committee, you know, may cooperate, you know, with the service. Okay, they may cooperate with the service, and they also. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So they may cooperate with what with the service. And also, they may also, you know, pick from the uh from the staff, okay, of the FRS. But this may be deemed necessary for the effective performance of its functions under the act. So maybe probably they see that oh, this, this person has this competency or is capable of this and that so let's bring the person in do you understand so as they may deem fit so what are their functions one they have to consider all task matters and this may require professional and technical expertise okay then also advise the board on any aspect of the functions and powers of the service and attend to social matters which may from time to time be referred to it by the board, which may be referred to it by the board. So now let's look at the functions of the FRS. The function of the FRS. So you know, I, I, at the beginning I said to start with, you have to register people. Have you? you have to register companies before you can call them taxpayer. Those that are not registered, they are not taxpayer yet because they are not paying tax. Have you? If you want to call someone footballer, the person must be doing what? Hello. Must be practicing. 
the person, if you want to call someone footballer, the person must be doing what? Practicing football, right? Yes. If you want to call someone an accountant. The person, the person must, have, be... must have gone through a um, form of education or training on accountancy. Thank you. So, for you to have someone or your company as a taxpayer, you must have do what? Must have gone through registration. Thank you. So companies are required to register for TAS and file their audited accounts and TAS computations with FIRS within six months of their financial year end. Within six months of what? Of their financial year end. And this was what I was explaining earlier, that for companies with 31st December year end, by 30th June 2023 of this month, okay, their accounts will be due for filing, meaning that penalty will start accruing. And sorry, the account will be overdue. Okay, so it is due already. So it is due between 1st January to what? To 30th June. So, but it will become overdue after 30th June. And that's when penalty and what? Penalty and interest start accruing. Penalty and interest start accruing. So, because we are doing this on a self-assessment basis, okay? So, unlike what we have in South Africa, in South Africa, it is their tax authority that determines the tax they pay. Do you understand? So, there's no stress, okay? So, within six months of the financial end on a, on a self-assessment basis, or 18 months after incorporation, or 18 months after incorporation, whichever comes first whichever comes first. So a company may file an application for extension of filing tax returns for up to two months at discretion of the FIRS. So if you know that, oh, your books are not ready, okay? There'll be a delay in, in finalizing your audited financial statement. So you can request for extension of filing of tax returns. Okay, you can request for extension of filing of tax uh, returns but for a maximum period of, of two months. So the company must file the following document with, it, with the task authority for the purposes of obtaining the company task identification number. Okay, for this is a typographic error for the purposes of obtaining the company task identification number. Okay, so one, your certificate of registration with the Corporate Affairs Commission must be filed. Then also, you must submit your memorandums and articles of association. Okay. Then also, the particulars of the return of allotment of shares from CAC 2.5 and copy of the particulars of first directors from CAC 2.3. Okay. So those are, the, those are the documents that are required for registration. This is just one part. Okay. So that's just that's just one part. So upon registration, you'll be issued to view the team number, tax identification number. So this serves as the company's you know, account number, as mentioned earlier. And it should be used on all your official correspondences with the FIRS. You understand? So then the next thing is what is the documents to be filed by corporate taxpayer with the tax authority on an annual basis. Okay, so company must file the following documents on an annual basis with the tax authority. One, tax computation. You must prepare your tax computation. Two, the audited financial statement for the respective period. So this should, this should be in conformity with the international financial reporting standards. So, you, and that's why it will be an audited financial statement. No auditor will, you know, uh, uh, sign, or include his opinion in an account that is prepared on NGAP. Because all companies are, by now, all companies are expected to have migrated you know, to IFRS. To IFRS, okay? So there are also a duly completed and signed self-assessment form for CIT and evidence of remittance of the income tax liability partly or in full payments, partly or in full payments. So also, section eight, subsection one, 
of the value added tax act. So because you're not only registering for what's it called for the same number alone. So because in practice, since telling in practice when you are registering, you register for both your team number and your validator's number certificate. Okay, so they give you a validator's number and a certificate. So meaning that you have duly registered, you are now a registered task payer. So and when you are submitting all these documents, you don't just take the documents there. So you do a cover letter. Okay, you do a cover letter with a subject registration for team number as a taxpayer or registration as a taxpayer open bracket team number and then for the VAT to registration for valid task purposes registration for registration for valid task purposes the team for the registration for team you may put it as registration for uh, registration as a taxpayer open bracket team number or registration for task purposes as you may wish okay so that's with the cover letter, then you state the documents you are submitting in that cover letter. Are we together? So section eight, subsection one, subsection one of the valid tax act says a taxable person shall within six months of the incorporation or commencement, and within sorry, within six months of commencement of the valid tax act, or within six months of commencement of his business, you know whichever is earlier. So meaning any company for now, it will be six months from the commencement of the business because the validated task act has long since you know, been uh, enacted. So six months from the commencement of their business, register with the Federal Revenue Service. Then the Finance Act, the Finance Act also, okay, Finance Act of uh, 2019, the finance Act of 2019 also states that uh, the Section 35, the Section 35 of the Finance Act, you know, uh, amends the provision of Section 8, Subsection 2 of the Valid Tax Act. So, saying without prejudice to the provision of Section 32 of the Valid Tax Act, a taxable person who fails or refuses to register within, within board. Okay, or refuse to register with the board, shall pay what? Shall pay a fine. Okay, so any person that refuses to register with the board within the stipulated time, what's the stipulated time? That's six months. Okay, so shall be liable to penalty and interest. So the finance act, uh, you know, increase the penalty towards 50,000 naira for the first time you fail to register. So if you commence business on January. So it means that you should have registered between January and 30th June. Between January and 30th June. Otherwise, you'll be liable to penalty. So as at 1st January, you are liable to penalty of 50,000. Eh, 1st of July, rather, you are liable to penalty of 50,000 naira. Subsequently, if you fail to register with the FRS, you will be also liable to penalty of 25,000 naira. For every month the failure continues. For every month, which the failure continues. Are we together? So then registration by government ministries departments as agents of the board. So before we start this, do you have any question for me? Any question? For me, no. Okay. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Or is summer, summer board? No, today's only, today's only is more interesting than the I, 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 ISA Wahala. <laughs> OK, well, I hear you. Just try to familiarize yourself with, with those standards. OK, so now we are talking about the registration by government ministries. So I know the question you want to ask is, do they also have to register? There are governments now. Is government giving governments money? Okay. So let's look at the relevant sections of the uh, of the tax act. So section nine, subsection one of the validated tax act says every government, okay, 
So you add A after the T. Every government ministry, every government ministry, statutory body, and other agencies, so you call them MDAs, okay, of the government shall register as agents of the board for the purpose of collection of tax under this act. So they, they are not paying tax, but they must register for, purpose of, for the purpose of collection of tax. So you ask, uh, is it not the FIS that is granted the power to collect tax from people? Yes, but the FIS also have the right to appoint people, okay, as its agents for the purpose of collecting tax, just like what it's recently, you know, the FIS recently, uh, you know, uh, appoints MTN, recently appoint MTN and LTEL, MTN and HealthTel as what as an agent of us of VAT, withholding tax and VAT. So it means that these people can withhold VAT at source. They can what they can withhold VAT at source. So if you are their vendor, you know you you will be you will include valid tax in your invoice. You include valid tax in your invoice. So ordinarily it is expected that they pay the valid tax together with your uh, invoice amount, that is the net invoice amount. But now for MTN and Airtel, they will withhold the VAT portion and they will only pay you your exact amount. Okay, so they will remit the VAT on your behalf. They will remit what they will remit the VAT on your behalf. Are we together? So, and this is similar to what the uh, various government ministries, departments, and agency does. Okay, so that's what they do. And then for we they do they, they does that. Uh, sorry, they do that for they do that for both withholding tasks and then uh what's it called and value added tasks. So section nine of section two of the value added tasks act also says that every contractor transacting business with a government ministry, statutory board, and other agents of the federal, state, or local government shall produce evidence of registration with the board as a condition for obtaining contract. So apart from the ministry's department and agency, you know, registering as an agent for the purpose of collection of tasks, their contractors, they should also ensure that their contractors, customer, whoever is doing business with them, registered with the FRS as well as a task payer. So this should be a condition uh, for awarding the contract. Please, I have a question. You can go ahead. And now, what are the requirements for MDS in registering as agents of government? There are requirements. Yes, like you have and companies who have to. They, they have their quota. They have their quota. They are qualified to register as MDAs. Yeah, so what will be asked of them now for their registration? That's what I'm asking. Like, what do they have to supply? What, what do you expect them to supply? They, didn't, they don't have to supply anything. So they are, okay. is that, for instance, now, you want mm. to, uh, uh, how do I call it self? Let's say you are College student. withholding. You are a student in, in a school. Okay, you are a student in a school. And they are now looking for people that will help them distribute uh, flyers or that will bring people, students for them. You are a student of that school, let's say it's a private university, and they, are, they also want more students. So what will they require of you to help them bring in more students? Hmm? So it's not as if those same days will be getting commission from FIRSO. So what will they require of you to be bringing student for them? For, for them? Just your assistance eh, to help them hand out flyers and maybe uh, inform them through whatever means. So, so the MDs, they are, they are just like a police for the FIRS. Okay? Because a lot of people do business with the MDAs. Do you understand? A lot of okay. people do business with the MDAs. Mm -hmm. So, if they are not registered, 
as an agency of the FRS, as an agent to the as an agent to the FRS. So it means that we have a lot of people evading tasks. Okay, so it's just one of the one of the measures to reduce tax evasion. Okay, so ordinarily it is government to government. Do you understand? So it is government to government. So what they just need to do is to register them in their portal. And almost all the MDAs are registered already. So except for any MDA that they will be creating. Okay, except for any MDAs that they will be creating. But for the ones that are in existence, they are duly registered. And again, I want to believe they have their own portal where they can register. Do you understand that? And if there's anything, I've not worked in the public sector. So if there's anything that will be required of them, I want to believe the FIS will ask them. But from my own perspective, so they are they are the same. So it's like brother and sister. So you want to do anything for your sister, what will your sister require of you to bring before you can do that thing for her? Do you understand? So it's not as if they will be paid. So they are just collecting on their behalf and they must permit it. So do you know that the FIS will also go and audit them? I've explained that yes, before. Yes, I know that. I know, I know all of that, but I'm just... So they will, they will audit them. And the reason why they are auditing them is to ensure that all the monies they collect on their behalf are appropriately and fully remitted to them. So that's that. So non-registered companies also required to register with the FIRS. And then also, so let's move to the types of assessments. Types of assessments. Uh, so I'm just intrigued by what kind of registration would they have to do? But it's okay, your explanation is uh, okay. I'm sorry, you know, nobody knows it though. So from what I know, I'm not sure there is any specific document they ask them. So apart from the document that established them, so I wish they always have a, a legal document, which is the act that established that agency or that established that department or that creates that ministry. Do you understand? So apart from that, unlike a company, there's no, but for MTN and the uh, Airtel, okay, so those ones, they are already they are registered taxpayer already. So they are registered with FRS already. So if there will be any other additional documents, they, they are taken to the FRS. I want to believe it's just a form that they will sign. So a, a kind of service levy agreement, agreement between the FRS and M10 or LTEL. Do you understand? So types of assessments. So we have government assessments, turnover assessment, self-assessment, additional assessment. So government assessments is an assessment raised by the tax authority on taxpayer, either on account submitted or at the discretion of the uh, tax authority. So at times you can call it best of judgment. You can call it what's best of what's best of judgment. So most times this happens when the taxpayer is reluctant or the person has not even registered as a taxpayer, you know, the company, they are just doing business, they didn't bother about the, the registration. The FIS has sent them letters, invite them to come and register and the like, but they failed, you know, they failed, they didn't honor the letter, they didn't register. So the FIS might just come up with an assessment. So I'm sending it to them and ask them to go and pay. So and failure to do that, and failure to come and register, they, Result to you know sealing seal off of the uh, sealing of the premises of the of the company or restricting them to work. So then for turnover basis, usually these happen in line with section 55, section 55 of CETA, section 55 of CETA, which says that. Uh, the FRS, you know, has the power to assess company on turnover. And this usually is, uh, usually happens to the non-resident company, non-resident company. So, so 
So it usually happens to the non-resident company, but at times it happens to the resident company too. So for instance, maybe in the opinion of the FRS, they felt that your self-assessment does not show the exact, you know, the actual task you should pay or that is payable. So they may come up with, you know, an assessment. So then they base it on your turnover. I, I, I also believe you, we all know what turnover is, that's revenue, okay? So they base it on your gross turnover revenue plus other income. Then they, use, they determine a threshold, okay? So let's say maybe 20%. So they take 20% of your revenue, they take that as adjusted profit or accessible profit, then they multiply it by Sorry, they multiply it by the uh, applicable company income tax rate. They multiply by the applicable company income tax rate. Are we together? So, then also we have the you know uh, income tax transfer pricing regulations of 2012, and it was subsequently amended so to income tax regulation. Uh, transfer pricing of 2018. Okay, so then for the self-assessments, I've said this earlier. So the task law in Nigeria allows for taxpayer to assess themselves to task. Okay, to assess themselves to task. So uh, but this must be done within six months after the accounting year ends. Okay, and you can apply to the FRS in writing to pay your income tax in installments or to request for extension of time for filing of returns. So the maximum number of uh, installments the FRS may grant you will not be more than three installments. So then if you are writing this application, you must, as an appendix, you must attach the Evidence of payment of the first installment. This is part of the condition for your, uh, you know, application to be approved. Then for additional assessment, I've explained this briefly as well. So it has to do with the FRS discovering, you know, in their opinion, if they felt that the income uh, tax you pay, you know, or they felt that you have not assessed yourself to tax, uh, in line with the provision of the relevant tax law, or, or you seems to have been to you seems to have under, under understated your tax return or under assess yourself. Okay, so they do their computation and come up with additional assessment. So additional assessment means that they recognize whatever you have assessed yourself to before, and they only ask you to pay the difference. They only ask you to do what to pay the uh, difference between the tax you have initially paid uh, and what and uh, uh, what they felt your tax income tax payable should be are we together so that's that so we have, we still have some other ones we have dividend basis okay we have gross income basis okay we have dividend basis we have gross income basis which other one do we have okay so those are the ones that I can remember for now. I'm sorry. Okay, so then let's look at penalty for non-compliance. So we've seen the powers granted to the tax authority and the likes, but then they still have the power. Okay, so where taxpayer fails. So we've taken that of our data, 50,000 for the first time, then 25,000 for subsequent failure. So for company income tax, where a company has failed to file within the speculated time, okay, then the company will be liable to penalty of 25,000 for the first month. So any company with December 31st end that fails to file as at June 30th, that fails to file as at June 30th, 2023, okay, we have cost to pay Penalty of twenty five thousand naira in June in July. Penalty of twenty five thousand naira in July. Anything from first of July, okay, from one one a.m. 
first of July, the person will be liable to penalty of 25,000 Naira. And for every month the failures, for every month the failure continues, for every month the failure continues, the person will be also will be liable to 5,000 Naira. So if by July the person fails to, to pay, okay, then by uh, after July, what do we have? We have August, the person will pay additional 5,000 Naira. September, the person never pay. Ingo pay 5,000. Okay, October, I never pay plus 5,000. November, I never pay five. So that's how it, we continue to accrue, 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 accrue until the person, you know, clear of all the debts, until the person clear of all the debts are we together. So, and it's not just this penalty, okay? It's not just this penalty. So there will be, so this penalty is for failure to, ah, oh my God. It's just for failure to comply. Oh. Then there's another penalty for you holding government money, for holding government money. So let's, as, let's say that the income tax you should have paid within that stipulated time is, let's say, 1 million naira. That's the income tax you should have paid within the stipulated time before the, due date overdue, okay? So we then pay 10% of this money. We pay 10% of this money as penalty, okay? So this is another penalty. So penalty for holding government's money, we pay 10% of the income tax payable plus interest, plus what? Plus interest at the prevailing commercial bank rates, okay? Or the prevailing monetary policy rates, prevailing monetary policy rates. Are we together? 15 era, who mentioned 15 era? Martin Day, I didn't mention 15 era. Or did anyone hear me mentioning 15 era? Hello? No, no. Okay, maybe I, I, I'm thinking if I mentioned that by error. Okay, so, so you can see that the cost of compliance is quite cheaper than the cost of no compliance. If you do 10% of this one, then uh, how much is that? That was 100,000 error. If you do, let's say 18%, no, the rate, interest rate is not even 18%, maybe let's say 25%. Okay. You do 25% of 1 million naira. How much is that? That's 250,000 naira. So imagine what you are paying. 100 plus 250, that's 350. 25 plus 5, 30 plus 5, 35 plus 5, 40 plus another 45,000 naira. So you'll be paying 395,000 naira because you fail to comply. Eh? Because you fail to comply. So, yeah, I didn't write any 50,000. Yeah, the 50,000 has to do with VAT. That's the failure for filing your VAT returns or registering your VAT return as of when you. Okay, so 50,000 are the first time you go to pay rent. Then 25,000 are for the first time you go to pay Thank you, yeah. Okay. Thank you. No question. Okay, so. Sorry, I have a question. Okay. The penalty and interest paid, is it not supposed to be monthly? Monthly? Yes. No, when you are not IT, is the ITA that did their own? Monthly, is it monthly or daily self? Though with the task promise now, with the task okay. promise, it okay. accrues daily. The task promise, it accrues daily, but that's not what we have in the in the task law. But with what the task promise is doing, okay, so it will favor task payers to some extent, okay, and it's it is a kind of the FRS being fair enough to the taxpayer. Do you understand? So, but 
failing to fire as at July, so you bring out that 25,000 at first, Pim. okay? So then for the penalty, it will compute it based on the number of days that's falling due. But ordinarily in the task law, you should have you should apply it straight. Mm -hmm. You should apply it straight. Okay. So that's that, that's that's that. So that's one part. So let's look at the objection and appeal process. So do you have any question before we go? Any question? For me, no. Okay. No. Okay, thank you. So, we are looking at the objection and appeal process now. So, we have the task appeal tribunal. We have just limited to task appeals. Okay, because, you know, the FIRS, you have sent them a notice of objection, and they have now sent you a notice of refusal to amend your objection. A notice of refusal to amend your objection. What do you do? The next thing is to run to that baba and who is the baba? The task appeal tribunal. So we have a notice of refusal to amend has been served by the board on the taxpayer. The taxpayer, if he so wishes, can appeal against the assessment within 30 days from the date of service of that notice. Look at it again. If the taxpayer wishes, that is, if you are if you disagree, okay, if you are aggrieved with their refusal to amend and you cannot still pay the assessment they have raised, so you can appeal against the assessment within 30 days, anything 31st or first of the following months will be disregarded. Okay, so it will be 30 days from the date of service of that notice. So from the date you receive the notice. So if you receive the notice on May 31st, so you should know by June 29, by June 29, your 30 days will expire. So if you are taking anything to the tribunal by June 30th, it will not be recognized. Okay, so then who is the task appeal tribunal? The task appeal tribunal under the administration of taxes in Nigeria. Okay, so one of the, one of its function is to, you know, uh, settle disputes between uh, the taxpayer and the tax administrator, which is the FIRS. Okay, so so that's what they do basically. So section fifty nine of the FRSCA provides for the establishment of the tribunal, while the fifth schedule to the act makes provisions for the jurisdiction, authority, and procedure of a task appeal tribunal. So according to the fifth schedule to the FRSCA, first ones to section 59, subsection one of this act, there shall be established a task appeal tribunal Hearing after referred to as the tribunal to exercise the jurisdiction, powers, and authority conferred on it by or under this schedule. It also states that the minister may by notice in the Federal Gazette specify the number of zones, matters, places in relation to which the tribunal may exercise jurisdiction, <clears throat> in which the tribunal may exercise jurisdiction are we together are we together yes so now that we know the section that established the task appeal tribunal then we also understand why why we should go to the tribunal i want to believe so then the next thing is to look at who are the task appeal commissioners okay so that is who, who administer this tribunal so the tribunal has commissioners. So a tax appeal tribunal shall consist of five members. Shall consist of what? Shall consist of five members. 
referred to as TAS appeal commissioners, referred to as TAS appeal commissioners to be appointed by the Minister of Finance. Again, a TAS appeal tribunal shall consist of five members referred to as TAS appeal commissioners to be appointed by the Minister of Finance. They are appointed by the Minister of Finance and not the President. So the chairman of each zone shall be a legal practitioner who has been qualified to practice for a period of not less than 15 years with cognate experience in task legislation and task matters. Then also a chairman shall preside at every sitting of the tribunal and in its absence, the members shall appoint one of them to be the chairman. The quorum at any sitting of the tribunal shall be the, shall be what, shall be three members shall be what shall be three members. Then a person shall not be qualified for appointment as a task appeal commissioner unless he is knowledgeable in the field of law, accountancy, economics, taxation in Nigeria, as well as persons that have shown capacity in the management of trade or business or a retired public servant in task administration. A retired public servant in task administration. Hope you are taking good note of this. Then also the task appeal commissioner shall hold office for a term of three years, renewable for another term of three years only. That is, you cannot do more than first and second term. And no more from the date on which the, he assumes his office or until he attains the age of 70 years, whichever is earlier. So if he attained the age of 70 years in the second year of office, then the tenure has expired. Are we together? Then also as often as may be necessary, the tax appeal commissioner shall need to hear appeals in the jurisdiction or zone assigned to that tribunal. And where a tax appeal commissioner has direct, has direct or indirect financial interest in any appeal pending before the tribunal or where the taxpayer is or was a client of that tax appeal commissioner in his professional capacity, he shall declare such interest to the other tax appeal commissioners and refrain from sitting at any meeting for the hearing of that appeal, for the hearing of that appeal. Are we together? So it means that if you are one of the tax appeal commissioner. And the taxpayer in question is your husband company. The taxpayer in question is your husband company. Don't tell me you will still be part of that commissioners that will be sitting or presiding over the matters of your husband. You will definitely compromise. Have I lied? Is that not true? Not really. Not really, you will not compromise. You will compromise. No. I tell you, you will compromise. This thing I'm telling you has once happened to the president of the Court of Appeal. I don't want to mention him. Okay. So one of the president of the Court of Appeal whose husband happened to be uh, you know, a former senator. So that's it. You be compromised. This is your husband. Okay, so it's better you excuse yourself from sitting at the airing of that appeal. Okay, so even if it's your if it's your husband friend, if it is your friend, okay, it could be your father, it could be your mother, any person that has close relationship with you. So this is to avoid biasness of mind. Okay, so because you should not be biased in delivering your in reaching your professional judgment. That's what we call professional skepticism. That's what we call professional skepticism. Okay, so you should not be biased. There should be no biasness of mind. So you should be independent of mind and independent and in appearance. So that's that. Do you still have any other thing? Okay, so we have jurisdiction of the tribunal. Paragraph 11 
of the fifth schedule to the FIRSCA sets out the jurisdiction of the Tax Appeal Tribunal. These are one, the power to adjudicate on disputes and controversies arising from the tax laws, the various tax laws. So, in execution of this jurisdictional power, the tribunal must apply such provisions of the tax laws referred to in paragraph 11, subsection 1, as may be applicable in the determination or resolution of any dispute over any dispute or controversy before it. So if the issue is valid tax act, the act in line with the provision of the valid tax act. So whatever decision, whatever judgment they will be you know, making must be referenced to, us, to the relevant provision of the valid tax act. So it's not that they just see that, that oh, a guy fires, why you why you be asking my husband to pay additional tax? Got away. He is not paying any additional tax. Okay. So if you are sure that your husband should not pay additional tax, then you must you should prove it to us by making relevant provisions, by making relevant uh, you know, reference to the provision of the word, of the tax law, particularly the one the matter before you relates to are we together. So then the, still on the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So we've taken the, uh, the provision of the fifth schedule. Okay, so we also have the powers of the tribunal. We have the powers of the tribunal. So the tribunal for the purpose of discharging their duty or their functions, okay, as mentioned under the fifth schedule to the Federal Inland Revenue Service Establishment Act of 2007, they have power to summon and enforce the attendance of any person and examine him on oaths, require and discovery and production of documents, receive evidence of affidavits, call for examination of witnesses or documents, just like what we are saying with INEC. The uh, APC, PDP, and then the Labour Party. Okay, so imagine the number of witnesses PDP and Labour Party are bringing. Okay, so that's a good example. Then review its decision. We have also seen the number of uh, application, the tribunal, the election tribunal has dismissed. Okay. So the, the task of the tribunal can also dismiss an application for default or deciding matters as part, set aside any order or dismissal of any application for default or any other passed by it, do anything which, in the opinion of the tribunal, is incidental or ancillary to its function under the fifth schedule. So uh, the procedure before the tax appeal tribunal. There are rules and procedures guiding the tribunal in discharging their duties. And the paragraph 15 of the fifth schedule to FIRSEA lays down the fact that as often as may be necessary, tax appeal commissioners shall meet to hear appeals in the jurisdiction or zone assigned to that tribunal. So the election tribunal is currently held in Abuja. Okay, so the task appeal tribunal too. Okay, so it depends on where the taxpayer uh, uh, jurisdiction is. Okay, so if the taxpayer jurisdiction is Lagos, then they use that of Lagos. So I think there is two in Southwest or so. Maybe it's two or one, I'm not that sure. But seems we have one in Lagos, okay? So, so in you know the, jurisdi the, the jurisdiction or zone assigned to that tribunal. Then also, where a tax appeal commissioner has a direct or indirect financial interest, I've mentioned it, okay? So an indirect financial interest is that of your husband, okay? So your husband is the taxpayer and you are the wife. Do you understand? So you cannot remain as the commissioner that we, you know, uh, that will address his issue. 
because they have an indirect financial interest. If your husband is not paying you salary, he shall be giving you money for basic items, basic things. Feeding is there, your accommodation, everything. The car you are using says it may even be your husband that gets it from you. Do you understand? So that's an indirect financial interest. Or your in-law, your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law, your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your, your father-in-law, your mother-in-law, any type of in-law. You understand? You have indirect financial interest. It could be your nephew, it could be your cousins. They are, you have direct, indirect financial interest. And your own direct financial interest is if you have shares in that company. Okay? If you have shares in that company, or probably you're an ex employee of that company. Okay? So that's a direct example of a direct interest. So where a tax appeal commissioner has a direct or indirect financial interest in any appeal, pending before the tribunal where the taxpayer is or was a client of that tax appeal commissioner in his professional capacity, then the commissioner must declare such interest to the other tax appeal commissioners and refrain, look at it, and do it, and refrain from sitting in any meeting for the hearing of that appeal because we don't want you to compromise, okay? We don't want you to compromise. You don't want you to be biased in giving your professional judgments, okay? So, and we don't want you to feel any undue influence. We don't want you to do it, to feel any undue influence. Hello, are we together? Yes. Hope I'm not too boring. Not at all. I'm sorry, we have not got into the topics we will be doing in calculation. So this one we just have to talk, 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 talk. But they form the basis of whatever we'll be doing in our subsequent subsequent classes. So if you don't understand them, then you may be finding it difficult to understand the subsequent classes. And the examiner body has always, you know, test some of these things we are discussing. Okay, so the procedure before the task appeal tribunal, you can read this, they are quite straightforward. There's no, the grammar is not too much. Okay, so, so it's then, it extended here. So we are upon the hearing of an appeal. Okay, so no accounts, books or records relating to the profits were produced by or on behalf of the appellants. So the, the appellant has appealed, but he could not provide any account, books, or records. Such accounts, books, or records were so produced, but rejected by the tribunal on the ground that it had been shown to its satisfaction that they were incomplete and unsatisfactory, just like we see it in the election tribunal. Okay, so the dismissal of some documents, rejection of some, you know, and the like. So the appellant or his representative at the end of the appeal has neglected or refused to comply with a notice delivered or sent to him by the secretary to the tribunal without showing any reasonable cause, or the appellant or any person employed, whether confidentially or otherwise by the appellant or his agents, other than his legal practitioner or accountant, acting for him in connection with his liability to task, has refused to answer any question put to him by the tribunal without showing any reasonable cause. In this case, the chairman of the tribunal shall record particulars of the same in his written decision, in his written decision. So, and you know, after giving all parties an opportunity to be heard, the tribunal, you know, may confirm the assessments initially raised by the task authority, or reduce the assessments initially raised by the task authority, or increase, okay, the assessments as initially raised by the uh, increase the assessment from what was initially raised 
and may annul. Okay, it may what may annul the what the assessments. So or make any such order as it deems fit, as it was as it deems fit. So and whichever of the party is aggrieved, may proceed to the high court. Okay, so whichever party is aggrieved, may what may proceed to the high court, whether be it the taxpayer or the tax authority. So every decision of the tribunal must be recorded in writing by the shaman and subject to the provision of paragraph 16 of the fifth schedule, okay? So then all parties, okay, must be what must be uh, circularized with a copy, a certified copy of such decision. So they must be supplied with what, a certified copy of such decision to all parties, the appellants, FIRS, you know, so this must be done by the secretary of the tribunal. And this will also be done upon request made within, within 30 days of the decision of the tribunal. So if the decision of the tribunal is on 1st or 30th of April, so before 30th of May, you must have made request for a copy of the decision because you want to proceed to the federal high court. Now we are at the federal high court. What are we presenting at the federal high court? That decision reached by the tribunal must also form part of what? Must also form part of the schedule that we'll be submitting, you know, to the federal high court. Because we are grieved. And the paragraph 17 of the fifth schedule allows us. Okay. So appeals from tax appeal tribunal lies to the federal high court. Hmm? Okay. So because we are dissatisfied, but we must ensure that we write the secretary of the tribunal within 30 days after the date on which the tribunal has made its decision. Then we serve same to the federal high court. So a notice of appeal filed pursuant to subparagraph one, this is the paragraph one, of this paragraph shall set out all the grounds of law on which the appellant case is based. Then also the appellant Okay, sorry, this, if the service is dissatisfied, if the service is dissatisfied with the decision of the tribunal, it may appeal against such decision to the federal high court on points of law by giving notice in writing as specified in subsection one of this section to the secretary within 30 days. I've mentioned this. So upon receipt of a notice of appeal from the appellants, the secretary to the tribunal shall cause the notice to be given to the chief registrar of the federal high court, okay, along with all the exhibits tendered at the hearing before the tribunal, all the exhibits tendered at his evidence, okay, document tendered at the hearing before the tribunal. So you, for the election tribunal, just can, you can imagine the number of documents, witnesses and the likes the, uh, the Labour Party has brought, the PDP as well against the APC. So the same thing also happens in tax appeal tribunal. When, if they are aggrieved, they are not satisfied with the decision of the tribunal, they go to the high court, from the high court to the court of appeal. So from the high court to the court, to the court of appeal, and lastly to the world, to the uh, Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court is what is in. Uh, is the best court we have in Nigeria. Okay, so any, appeal against the decision of the federal high court at the instance of either party, be it the service or the tax authority lies to the court of appeal. Are we together? Okay, so that is that. So the same process goes for court of appeal, then, but for, uh, for Supreme Court, then you can't move further. That's the end of the cinema. Do you understand? So whatever decision is made by the Supreme Court is binding on all parties to the words, to that case. So now we look at statute of limitation and powers of the tax authorities to audit. So I've discussed this briefly the other time. So applicability of limitation period is undoubtedly a good principle in our tax laws. You know, that was when I was explaining six years, eight years and the like. So it serves a numerous purposes and the relevance should be maintained. 
So as a major stakeholder and key driver for the economy, the tax authorities should ensure transparency and fairness in its application. Okay, so, uh, and certainty is one of the hallmark of a good tax system. Remember your principles of taxation. So a taxpayer should know the time frame within which it can be held responsible for previous non-compliance. And uh, we say that the period, the, the period should not be more than five or six years. So the tax authority cannot go beyond that, except where there is open years. Okay, that is a court of competent jurisdiction has allowed them to, you know, uh, go beyond the statutory years. How to get So this is probably one of the reasons the national tax policy canvasses for periodic and timely audits by the tax authorities to returns uh, of returns filed by taxpayers. Remember, I mentioned earlier that we have two types of audits, okay, which is periodic. The periodic audit is the feed audit. Abby, then we have what's what the second one I mentioned? Can anyone remind me? Oh yeah, oh, can you remind me? Oh. Hello now. Okay, oh, I want to assume you have not revised your notes. So we have the DEX review. We have the DEX review. Okay, so, so the this perspective you know is consistent with the provision of the company's income tax. So they should not go beyond uh, five years. They should not go beyond what five years. So it's also comes consistent with the provision of the personal income tax and the petroleum profit tax act. So it describes that taxpayers you know have an opportunity to recover any of payments uh, of tax within a six year period. So the laws also impose a six year limitation from the relevancy of assessment on the time frame within the tax authority may raise additional assessment. So if as a taxpayer, I cannot go beyond six years to claim my overpayment of tax, to recover my overpayment of tax. So you also as what, well, as a tax practitioner, you should not go beyond six years. You should not go beyond what? You should not go beyond six years. Are we together? So the Federal Land Revenue Service Establishment Act further stipulates that no officer, no officer shall make a demand for an under assessment or erroneous repayment of tax after five years. So that's their own act, okay, saying that none of its officer shall make or shall make demand for an understatement or was or repayment of tax after five years, after five years. So it is illogical to see the tax authorities, okay, uh, to carry out audits exceeding this period. So when you see them doing that, you tell them it is what it is statute bar. It is what it is what your statute statute bar. So it is statute bar. So it is logical that where the tax authorities have not carried out an audit on a taxpayer for a period of more than six years or more than five years, in the case of under assessment or erroneous payment, erroneous overpayment of tax, okay, the period beyond six or five years becomes what becomes statute bad because becomes statute what let's put it in past tense, okay, it becomes what statutes bad, okay, so you cannot go beyond that. So the only thing that can make them exceed this is what I mentioned it earlier. The only thing that can make them exceed this period of six years is what? When, while uh, investigating, you, uh, you find so them that's the So that's it. So the the legal weapon that is usually used by the tax authorities to open the bad period, okay? So to open what, to open the bad period is a recovery of tax on the basis that the taxpayer has probably be what fraudulent, okay? So fraudulent in the tax returns filed or is willfully 
defaulted. So that's the only thing. So they tell the court that this person has not been complying in intentionally did this, you know, does that. So, and especially when they mention tax evasion, oh my God, you know, it's a criminal offense. So this will now lift the statute bar. Do you understand? So the tax investigation we do is we lift the statute bar. So it will lift the statute bar and there was an open doors, yes. That's why we call it open was open, yes. Are we together? So what lifts the statute bar? What usually lifts the statute bar? Fraud. So there, there is an intentional or willful or willful default, non-compliance of the tax law, or there's fraudulent activity. Okay, so that's that. So you can read, you can read more from your study test or any other relevant task material. You can also read online. So what are the components of a good tax returns? So the audited financial statements, which details the profit and loss accounts and balance sheets, tax computations for relevant years, capital allowances, computations, duly completed and signed self-assessment income tax form, evidence of direct payment of the whole or parts of the taxes due. And don't forget that all of this cannot be done online without going to the FRS to submit physical copy. Okay, so it is also important to look at the due date for filing. The due date for filing in the case of a new company, okay, so that has been in business and that has not that has been in business within eight months. Okay, or well, let me just put it simple: a newly incorporated company. Okay, so the due date for filing is 18 months from the date of incorporation. 18 months from what? From the date of incorporation, or not later than six months, not later than six months after the company's year end, whichever is earlier. So if you commence business on 1st January 2022, and you've chosen 31st December as your air end, so it means that you are due for filing as at 30th June 2023. But in the case whereby you commence business on 1st of March, 1st of March 2022, and the shoes are, uh, what's it called? The shoes 31st of March, the shoes 31st of March, or uh, let's even say the shoes, okay, let's put it that way, 31st of, uh, sorry, 29th of February. Let's say the shoes 29th of February. Of every year, so it means that by by thirty first of August, by thirty first of August, twenty twenty three, you are due for filing. So if you count from that date of commencement up to thirty first of August, that should give you a period of nothing less than eighteen months. Okay, and if you are incorporated on any other day, other than your date of commencement. Okay, so you can't 18 months. Okay, you can't 18 months. So if you have not commenced business as at that 18 months after the date of incorporation, then you need to notify the FIRS. You need to do what? You need to notify the FIRS that you have not commenced so that, so that they will not start accruing penalty for you. But in the case of a company that has been in business, it should be within what? It should be within six months after the close of the company's accounting year. After the close of the company's accounting year. Then the penalty for late filing, we discussed it earlier. 10,000 for the first time, then 5,000 hours for subsequent failure. So any director, manager, secretary, you know, of a defaulting company, we is proved to be guilty of connivance, neglect, acquiescence to the commission of the offense 
of non-compliance with approved provision shall be liable of a fine of 100,000 error or imprisonment for two years. And in some other case, it could be both. It could be imprisonment and fine. So when is the payment due? So where an FRS, where an assessment is raised by a company, and sorry, is raised on a company by the FRS, this is expected to be paid within two months after the service of the notice of assessment. So in the case, uh, the two months expire after 14th December of the assessment year, then any outstanding balance is expected to be paid on 14th December of the assessment year. I know students do have issue with the interpretation of this provision. So what this means is that maybe the assessment was you know, raised, you were served the assessment on 30th November. Okay, on 30th November. So I, you know you have to pay within two months. So the next if the, the next month is December, which happens to be the first month. Okay. So you are expected to pay the money, but if you could not pay, you still have a grace of one month. But in the case where the two months will expire after 14 December, you know this first month now is December. So and if you are looking at the second month, when will that be? That would be January of the same of the following year, Abby. So what this means is that you must pay all the money before 14th of December because the FRS will also have to close their books. You understand? The FRS will also have to close their books. So then you look at the bonus on timely payment of tax. Section 18, 5A of Finance Act 2019 says that when a company pays its tax 90 days before the tax due, it shall be liable to, you know, no, sorry, sorry, this is a bonus, <laughs> sorry. So this comes from the finance Act of 2019. So LA payment of tax for, by medium-sized company, the company will enjoy 2%, but don't misinterpret it. It's not as if the FIS will be giving a tax payer cash, cash for you. You can only use it as a tax credit. You can only use that as, as a tax credit. So it means you, will not, you cannot enjoy it in that year. You can enjoy it, you can only enjoy it in the following year. So if you pay within 90 days before the due date of your filing, okay, within 90 days before the due date. So let's say you complain with 31st December, you know, you file your returns and you pay uh, before 31st of March, before 31st of March. So you're entitled, if you're a medium sized company, to 2% of that your tax liability. But that 2%, you can only accrue for it as what, as a tax credit, as an asset, okay? So you cannot, it's a lie, you cannot offset it against the current year tax. You can only offset it against the coming, uh, the future year tax. Then in the case of a large company, it will be 1%. I hope that is clear. Do you understand that? Hello, show you? Yes. Now, thank you. So you move to task clearance. So task clearance should pass the documents issued by the task authority to a task payer. So if I yeah. ask you, have any one of you seen a task clearance certificate before? Yes. How does it look like? Yes, for us, it has um, the components of the yes for which the taxes were deducted, the amount was deducted, and if there's any outstanding liability, they will be there to have the, the face of the, the pics of the taxpayer and the description of the taxpayer, that's the name and the uh, company for which the taxpayer is working. And then the now, nature of the employment. Yes. Corporate company, the corporate organization, the task plans are the of a corporate organization. Have you seen that before? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so a, 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 a typical task client certificate, we have the following. So uh, the total profit or chargeable income, the task paid, task speed, and any task outstanding. Alternatively, a statement to the effect that no task 
is due. A statement to the effect that no task is due. So what are the conditions to be fulfilled before using the task plan certificate? One, the task payer must file his tax returns up to date. The task payer must apply for TCC. All taxes assessed on the task payer must have been paid. Evidence of payment of VAT in the last three years and evidence of remittances payments of withholding tax up to date. However, the payment of the current year tax, okay, the payment of what of the current year tax shall not be what shall not be a condition, should not be made as a condition, okay, for the issuance of the certificate unless the taxpayer is leaving the country. The taxpayer wants to japa. Okay, so if the FRS is aware that the taxpayer wants to japa. And that's the reason why the, he or she is requesting for the task plan certificate. They will not grant it until he or she pays the outstanding task liabilities. So the same thing goes for the company too. So if the director wants to jump on, eh, you know, go, go, you know, go, go. Until you pay our task, you know, go, go. So that's that. So any question? So what are the uses of task clearance certificates? It's used for registration for motor vehicles. When you want to get contract from governments, you need a task clearance. When you want to get loan from bank, uh, for instance, bank of industry, okay. Then you want to get, uh, you know, trade license, like people in the, what was it called? Uh, aviation industry. Okay, so they need task clearance certificates. It's part of their trading license. Okay, so it's part of the application for their trading license. So application for transfer of real property, registration as a contractor, application for plot of land, a lot. Okay, so that's that. So uh, we have, what's it called? A decided case, which is the case of Warm Spring and Oz versus FRS on the issuance of TCC. I want you guys to go and read that. Go and read the case of Warm Spring and ORS versus FRS on the issuance of TCC. Gogu is my friend. So just go to Gogu. Pram, 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 pram. So you have a lot of write ups, articles on this particular case. But the outcome of this case is that the taxpayers were aggrieved. So not just one spring, there are other companies too, and that's the ORS. Okay, so other companies uh, include Seven Up Bottling Company, Ashmina Limited, Nigerian German Chemical PLC, Adama Beverages Limited, Nigerian Bottling Company Limited including Ragolis Water Nigeria Limited, Ragolis Waters Nigeria Limited. So we have a lot of companies like that. What's the issue? Imagine the number of companies that drag FRS to court. FRS no green win. Okay, so what happened was FRS is requesting for valid tax on bottled water. Okay, so they are requesting for us valid tax on what on what on pure water. Pure water and what and bottle water. Okay. I'm not sure if pure water is included, sure. But for bottle water, so they are saying because it has been packaged, the bottle water, the water is no longer you know packaged in the uh, nylon pack or nylon bag. Okay, now the companies are using bottle to pack water. They have advanced, so there is what. There's an evidence of us of creativity. So let's subject them to value added tasks. But thank God for the judge that presided over the case. The judge make reference to relevant provisions of the value added tasks act. Okay. And at the end, the judge, you know, restrain the FIRS. Or whosoever it may be, whether the agents and the likes, you know, refrain them from what from withholding 
or suspending the issuance of task clearance certificates to the companies on the ground of failure to pay VAT on bottled water, on the grounds of failure to pay VAT on bottled because these companies could not get their task clearance because of what the FIS is demanding for valid task on the bottled water from them. And thank God they didn't pay it. If they had paid, all companies doing bottled water now they also be paying valid tax on the bottle water. But that doesn't mean when you go to the supermarket, you're not paying valid tax on these drinks. Yeah, you will be paying valid tax because the supermarket is not selling it at the normal price. They have added value. They have added what? They have added value and they must pay the value added tax. <laughs> okay, so that's all for today. So, Thank you guys for being part of the class. So we spent um, more than three hours. Wow, that was too long for me. So my maximum time is two hours, okay? So in this class, we discuss the task structure, the task administration. We look at the various power that is vested to different task authorities, okay? So, and then also we discuss the Objection and appeal procedures. We also discussed the task clearance certificate, the procedures, the conditions for granting and its use. And also we briefly discussed about the uh, decided case of Warm Spring and other you know, uh, companies, okay, Warm Spring and House versus FIRS. Okay, so I have uh, some, you know, Short answer questions for you guys. I want you to answer them, but it will not be in this class. So answer them and send them to me via WhatsApp, as well as the following assignments. Okay, so please do take your time to attempt these assignments as they get you prepared for the coming exams. Thank you once again for joining me in class today. We have successfully come to the end of the class. Do I enjoy the rest? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.